scientific reputation doesn't get ruined. In other words, they're doing it in secret. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of so private citizens that are working on it, Randy, all over the country. Uh, some of them as that are in government, but they don't want to are in academia, but they don't they want can't acknowledge it publicly. They don't want to disperse their no. reputation in case it goes wrong. But nevertheless, they're sitting out there and, and beginning to work on it. And uh, mm -hmm. Tom is one of the one of the men who has uh, enough to him where he can stand out there on the limb, and nobody's going to saw it off after him because his his word is pretty good. Well, I appreciate well, the main it. advantage, you know, being very honest, the main advantage I have is that I really don't have any orthodox scientific reputation. Nor do I have any that I have to establish or defend. And I'm perfectly willing to live by the laboratory experiment. If the experiment keeps showing that we can have this kind of wave and we can have these kind of effects, then the scientific method says you have to change the theory. Now, if the experiments do not show that, then what I'm saying would be wrong, you see. And I'm perfectly willing to abide by that. That's called the scientific method. That's the way we ought to do it. So you need general support within the scientific community willing to look at these data and willing to at least consider the possibility of changing their whole framework. Yes, one of the problems, you see, <clears throat> is that nobody in the scientific community, no source of funding at the present time that I know of, is going to fund this kind of work. Mm -hmm. The reason that I'm able to do a little bit of this kind of work in my private life is because I'm able to make a decent living at another kind of skill and pay the grocery bill with that. And I'm able to afford to do a little bit of this in my private life. And so I do what I can. He does <clears throat> if a we lot. ever get it being believed, we will have funding sources and we'll have a lot of work done and we'll have a lot of progress real quick. And that's what we've got to get to. We've got to get it into the universities. I'll be following this. If you can just touch on one more thing, I'll let you go. When you talked about the, uh, the storms in Cal California last year that towned uh, Malibu, tore down the houses, um, people were saying that this is something that happened... 200 years ago, I think it was, uh, a number of meteorologists were speaking about that this is a natural occurrence and the only thing that's unusual is that we haven't been around in terms of recorded uh, meteorological activity to have that documented, but that actually all of these rains and the, uh, the, the way that they actually came in much more onshore than before was a natural occurrence that is, in a sense, cyclical but over a long period of time, and they explained it that way, at least most of the... I thought uh, it was results. an interesting explanation, being that it never yeah. been recorded before in the past. How <laughs> do they know that it happened? Oh, well, exactly. Now, are you saying that they plotted, in a sense, the Soviets, assumingly, over California, these points, and these points caused severe buildups of... Uh, go on with it. You, you explain. Okay, what I'm saying is <clears throat> they put radiation waves in a beam which has a certain width, mm -hmm. and by the time that thing gets over North America, it's pretty wide. <clears throat> and so over the United States and Canada, they established multiple beams like this, interfering with each other. The interference pattern is that grid I was talking about right, right over North America. Okay. The one that I'm seeing that a friend of mine and I saw sitting up in the sky, clear as a bell, right here over Huntsville, Alabama. Now... Once they had the grid in and adjusted and got through with all the controls and the phasing and everything, at that point, they had a system set up where they could do weather engineering. Now, that <clears throat> adjustment did occur just about, uh, they finished that thing about towards the end of February or so, or in the middle of February of 1983. And so they had that thing in place in time to influence the weather. Now, understand, <clears throat> they don't completely control the weather. They just influence and divert it. The more power they put in, the more diversion, the more influence they can get. And so that's what I think really happened. It's the degree of the storm you got and the misshapen path of the jet streams that's significant. It's not the fact that, uh, you know, nature never produces a violent storm. Of course it does. And I don't think we saw any storms more violent than anything's ever been produced. We didn't see that. We yeah, certainly right. saw the highest barometric pressure that's ever been recorded mm -hmm. in 1983. Well, they don't have a button that says rain and it'll rain. They, they can just that's move right. jet streams and change weather patterns, and we know how weather would ordinarily respond under those circumstances, if you could put it in a bottle. Well, listen, I really appreciate all the research you're doing, and I'll be following it. And thanks a lot, Bill. Thank you, Randy. Thank you. Well, thank you, Randy. Call. Nice talking to you. Okay, uh, Tim, you're on the line. Well, thank you, Bill. Uh, I want to thank both of you and your guests for uh, verifying the fact that I'm not crazy. Uh, 
because I believe I've seen these patterns. Uh, it really struck me. I was driving on the freeway, and I heard you describe the cloud pattern as being like the old Japanese rising sun symbol. Yes. Yeah. And I had seen that several times. Uh, Where, whereabouts? Well, I'd seen it in Iowa, just outside of Ames. Mm -hmm. And I'd also seen it in Bakersfield. And the latter instance was uh, in about, I would guess, August last year which is odd for Baker Street, you know, because it's not very cloudy there, but it's an agricultural area, and the same outside of Ames. And Ames I saw back, I would guess it was about March or April. And what struck me about it was how rapidly it appeared, you know, and in the Midwest you're used to these odd weather patterns, you know, because the weather's real strange there anyway, but to see it in that perfect symmetrical pattern. And what I was wondering about was, uh, is, is there any idea whether, like, animals have a sense of when this is going on or not. And I say this only because, you know, you've heard of these studies that say that animals, uh, you know, can predict earthquakes and the like through their behavior. Because in both instances, you know, before I had noticed anything going on in the sky, I had noticed something with some animals that were around, you know, on the farm there, too. For example, in Iowa, uh, we have a very large, you know, chicken house, and they just went berserk, literally. You know, just a, a frenzy of activity for seemingly no reason, and then suddenly I would look up and notice that here was this cloud pattern. And I was wondering whether they are more sensitive to these scalar wave type vibrations than maybe humans are, or what, or whether you've noticed that in your research. Yes, animals are more sensitive to scalar waves than humans. Uh, humans react to it, but they react unconsciously. What they tend to do is uh, change their mood, they get irritable. Or they change their emotions, or, you know, they get all moody and all upset and everything. Or they develop some symptom like fatigue or a twitch or something like that. So humans develop, uh, react unconsciously. Now, the animals are much closer to their unconscious than the humans, and so the animals react much more directly. Just as they react to the scalar waves emitted from the pressure just before an earthquake, they would react in an area where there's a very strong scalar radiation of this type. And I'm very glad you noticed that. That's a significant point. Because, well, you know, I, I really couldn't help you because, I, like I said, I've always heard the animals are very sensitive to changes like that, but I have never seen anything like that. And not just, you know, when I was in Iowa with all, with all the chickens, but when I was, you know, in Bakersfield and we had some dogs and some goats, and it was the same thing. Well, I Tim, mean, Tim, it's right on you, edge. Take your camera with you. <laughs> and snap that thing if you see it again. Well, I can't, my dog Briggs is with me all the time now, and if his ears go up, I start scanning the sky. I mean, I, I just never knew what I was looking at. I just, you know, put it down to, to odd weather phenomena, uh, like that one caller said earlier. Most of us, we just don't know it. You know, we don't know what we're looking at. Well, now we've, now we've got a tip-off from Tom, and let's keep our eyes open. Oh, I will indeed. Now, you know, I thank you for opening my mind on this, and now maybe it'll open our eyes, too. All right, Tim. Thank you. Thank you very bye -bye. much. Bye-bye. Appreciate the call. Thank you, Tim. Nice talking to you. Nice talking to you. It's happening over in, in Iowa, too. We're going to be back with Tom Bearden in just a moment. I'm Bill Jenkins. Tornadoes and floods and all of that. We have uh, Warren on the line. Warren, welcome aboard. Yeah, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Sure can. Okay. Um, I'm interested in the receiver. I'm a graduate student at the University of California down at San Diego. Mm -hmm. And in our lab... We have a superconducting magnet that we typically run at 40 kilogauss, but it'll go, it will go up to 80 kilogauss. Well, then you're ready to yeah. uh, detect scalar waves. Well, I'd like to talk with Mr. Bearden for a, just sure. a couple minutes about how I go about doing it. What, what, it, what it is, it's got about a one and a half inch diameter bore, and it's about 15 inches long. Uh, that's the center of the magnet. Okay. And we'll run it for like three days at a stretch. Okay. Now I'm wondering if I can use that to try to see these things. And, uh, with okay. the kind of strength you can get out of it, <clears throat> uh, when you get up to 40 kilogauss, which mm -hmm. uh, is the area you want to get to, that or higher, to get to uh, some sensitivity, uh, what you should try to do is this. Regard the detector that you're putting in there as just an antenna. It could be a straight piece of wire. It could be a coil or whatever. Just leave one end of it open. Don't, don't put a closed circuit. Leave one end open. From the other end, run it to a tuned circuit outside the device. And that tuned circuit, tuned to the frequency you wish to look to. Resonance frequency. About what frequencies would you 